Welcome, everybody. My name is Tracy Picornsalot, and I am the Professional Development Coordinator with Money Follows the Person. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Just a couple of very brief housekeeping items. Um, everyone is on mute, so if you have any questions, please enter them in your question chat box. And a copy of today's presentation is in the handout section on your control panel. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Trish Barnum. Trish? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy. I really appreciate uh, all of the incredible hospitality that the NFP team has made for us uh, to host this session today. Um, and really, really glad this session has come together. And appreciate all of you, all 166, 67 of you who are joining today. <clears throat> um, for those of you who I may not have had a chance to say hello to before, um, again, my name is Trish Farnham, and I am actually the former Money Follows the Person Project Director, um, and now serve in a slightly different role as a Senior Policy Analyst for uh, the Division of Health Benefits, Quality and Population Health uh, Program. So, uh, really um, excited about uh, this conversation today and to be among back among the MFP stakeholder uh, community. Um, we have a jam packed webinar today. So uh, as Tracy said, we, we welcome questions in the chat box, but we're going to uh, hold the questions unless there's an urgent one till closer to the end because we hope that we're going to be able to answer as many questions as we can, or excuse me, address as many potential questions as we're going through the, the, the screens. So again, thanks for being on the call today and your time. Um, one final shout out. I want to give a shout out to our uh, enrollment and member operations team colleagues, a few of them are on the call today. Uh, and really uh, deserve a lot of the credit for all the hard work that has gone into um, the enrollment broker process, the enrollment broker structure, and certainly providing some technical assistance to get ready for today's call. So thank you to you all as well. All right, Tracy, next slide. So we just want to kind of do a, a little bit of uh, managing expectations for today's call and know that uh, future calls are going to be uh, forthcoming, but we really wanted to spend a little bit of attention um, on the upcoming uh, Medicaid managed care enrollment process and uh, with a real focus on the beneficiary experience um, related to this enrollment process. In addition to that, we know that most folks on um, this call probably know about and maybe even attended to Tuesday's general enrollment broker session, um, overview session, we wanted to do a follow-up webinar for some specific areas for our beneficiaries who are older or have disabilities. So our long-term services and supports community, our aging and disability community, um, folks that really, uh, really rely not just on Medicaid for their health care, but in many ways uh, to live a full community-engaged life. Um, so we, our goal today is to focus on this kind of subset of the Medicaid beneficiary population and provide information at a high level about how these different uh, population groups may be impacted by the Medicaid managed care enrollment process. Um, and just, just so you know, we won't cover everything in this webinar, but we have more webinars scheduled, and we'll talk about the dates of those near the end of the session today. All right. So... I think it's probably fair to say that if you are receiving emails through the MFP listserv, you are aware that North Carolina is making a pretty major transition into Medicaid managed care. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, but that's not going to be uh, that's not going to be the focus of our conversation. We're going to kind of assume that people know that that's happening, and then we'll move into some of the the more uh, particular particular details. Um, we just want to start this webinar, though, by reassuring and saying that in this Medicaid managed care design effort, the department has consistently been and remains committed to really paying attention to the beneficiary experience through this entire process <laughs> and has established various uh, additional safeguards for some of our most vulnerable populations, including our long-term services and supports community. So it's really important to know that we as a department are really invested in getting this right uh, for our LTSS community. And uh, we'll, again, uh, we just wanted to re reemphasize that investment and that commitment today. 
So that said, we know there's a lot of information out there, and there's a lot of terms out there, and some of the terms make sense, and some of them maybe don't aren't quite as clear. And so we know that in order for us to have a really effective conversation today and in a really effective training today, we need to make sure there are some clear understandings of some really important terms. So, Tracy, you can go to the next slide. So there's lots of terms out there, but we're going to focus on three specific ones right now. And those are the three that are listed on the side, um, on the left side. So you may have started hearing a term called Medicaid Direct or North Carolina Medicaid Direct. And you may be wondering, what the heck is that? It is a newly branded name for our current Medicaid program. So when you hear about Medicaid Direct, it's trying to draw a distinction between our program as it exists today and the new options that will become available starting in November with our new uh, managed care health plan. So when you talk about Medicaid Direct, we're talking fee-for-service, plus the services that are covered by our LMEMCOs. Um, and also we're talking about PACE. Sometimes that gets missed in some of the general material. It's important to know that PACE, uh, for those of you on the call who use PACE, PACE is here. It's not going anywhere. It stays, and um, it's often kind of wrapped under the umbrella or under the umbrella of the Medicaid Direct term. Um, just to underscore that one more time, when we talk about Medicaid Direct, it's the system that exists now. Okay? The next term that's going to be important to understand is the, is the North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care term. And again, you'll see that in various forms. You've probably seen it a lot already. And the term is used to reference the five prepaid health plans, or sometimes called PHPs, or health plans, or sometimes the whole group is called the standard plan. So all of this, all of these terms are talking about the new move into Medicaid managed care. And again, trying to distinguish between our existing service delivery system and our new service delivery system. I know folks on this call in particular will, will, be, um, will want to point out, and very rightly so, that we actually already have managed care in North Carolina. The PACE program is a managed care model. The LME MCOs are a managed care model. So we understand that managed care already exists in North Carolina, but just because a lot of the branding related to the transformation efforts talk about North Carolina Medicaid managed care in terms of these particular five health plans, we want to make sure everyone's clear about what we're talking about today. And then the final term that I know a lot of people on this call um, have heard and are very interested in is the concept of the tailored plan. And just as a very quick overview, these tailored plans are not yet live, and they will special. But when they do go live in a few years, they will specialize. There will be specialty plans for members with significant behavioral health needs and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Like I said, they are not live now. The LME and COs that currently exist will actually serve as a foundation for the tailored plans when they do go live, and that is not going to be the focus of today's webinar, okay? So we know there's lots of information out there and lots of other orientations going on, so we're not going to focus on that today, all right? Next slide. The other, the other kind of just general baseline level setting that I wanted to make sure we did today was when we talk about managed care, we've talked a lot about what managed care, we've talked about, you know, managed care entities, and we've talked about North Carolina Medicaid managed care, and, you know, you'll see things like, well, it means that organizations are at risk and things like that. We wanted to make sure it was very clear, at least at a high level, what exactly managed care means. And so this slide, we're probably going to use kind of quickly, but hopefully you can come back to it if you need to, tries to give a visual representation on exactly what we mean when we say things are going to managed care. Okay? So on the left side in the blue, you see the state Medicaid program responsibilities related to managed care. So that Division of Health Benefits, the Department, North Carolina Medicaid, however you want to refer to it as, that's what we're talking about, is our state agency that manages the North Carolina Medicaid program. And when we talk about managed care, our state, is, our, our, our state agency has several responsibilities. They're not all left, left, excuse me, uh, reflected here, but we wanted to give you some of the key concepts. We will report the health plan that are through a contract and provide a payment for each member covered. We will be setting the service requirements that the health plans work under. We establish our quality goals for improving services and the health of our members. We 
monitor the plan's activity, and we set the strategic direction of all of this based on vision, legislative and regulatory requirements, and stakeholder guidance. We want to make sure you have a clear sense when we talk about managed care, what exactly the state's doing. When those contracts became executed and when those plans start to come online later this year, those plans are going to be responsible for providing services covered by the contract to those members covered by the contract. The plan will be responsible for building and managing a provider network that serves its members. The plans are responsible for providing care coordination and for many groups, care management. The plan is responsible for developing innovative services and approaches to meet members' needs. And finally, the plan is responsible for following our state's quality and oversight requirements. So at the end of the day, when we talk about managed care, it often comes down to a very straightforward contract concept. We establish what we need from the plans and the plans then execute what we've established. Okay, so that's probably a little oversimplified um, and, and perhaps probably old news for big people on this call, but we just wanted to make sure everybody had a clear sense of that. Okay, moving forward. So again, as you know, or, or likely know, earlier this year, the North, North Carolina uh, Department of Health and Human Services had a pretty big uh, announcement to make when the department uh, released its announcement that we are going to be contracting with several health plans that are identified here. So you probably started hearing these terms, I mean, hearing these uh, uh, proper names of these health plans. But just to reiterate, we have now contracted with WellCare. United Healthcare, Healthy Blue, which is a, 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 an extension of Blue Cross Blue Shield, Amera Health Caritas, and then we have one uh, entity that's called a provider-led entity, which is called Carolina Complete Health. Forgive me, I want to disregard uh, the October 14th, 2019 date at the bottom of that slide. That's a little, um, that's not accurate anymore, so we just want to make sure to uh, to just strike that through, and we'll make sure that we uh, delete that prior to uh, posting this webinar online. So, so those, are our, those are the entities that are going to be representing our North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care Program. All right, next slide. You've probably seen some version of this slide before, but we just again want to reiterate it, that our North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care Program is going to be divided into six regions, and they are reflected here. Um, you can go to the next slide. As you all probably also know, we are going to be launching managed care in phases. So the first phase will be regions two and four counties, and the the projected launch date is November 1st, 2019. So if you live in one of these counties or work in one of these counties, this presentation is going to focus on your timelines. Okay? Next slide. As you can imagine, we also have a region or phase two to cover the rest of the region. And those regions are reflected in green on this slide. And the launch date for these regions is February 1st, 2020. Okay, so we may not be focusing on your exact dates right now, but just know that we, our intention is to do this a similar webinar later this fall when that date, when those dates become more relevant in that region. Okay, so you've probably seen this slide before as well. If you were on the Tuesday slide uh, or Tuesday session, I know you did. Um, and this release, this is a diagram that reflects the timing of the enrollment process for phase one regions. So again, if you're in one of those regions, two and four, four, that are going to start, that are going to launch in November, this is the anticipated and projected timing of all the events that are going to lead up to that point. Okay? The reason we are having this call today is the first part of this timeline. And you'll see that the June 28th date is, is officially marked on this timeline, and that's today. Because over the next several weeks, 
the enrollment broker process is really going to become active. And we want to make sure you all have at least some high-level insight on what may happen over the next several weeks so that you know what's coming into your mailbox or coming into your beneficiary's mailbox and that you know a little bit about the kind of letters they may receive and you may know a little bit about what their enrollment kind of trajectory may be. So when we talk about letters in this presentation, it's these letters we're talking about. It probably would have actually been a better term to use packets because it's actually going to be broader than just a letter. But it, the packets will include a letter that we're going to be talking about today. These letters are going to start being mailed in the next few weeks for regions two and for people in regions two and four. It's important to know, especially in our aging and disability community, a lot of people will not receive one. Okay, so it's really important to clarify that. All right, next slide. So we know with all of the conversations underway and all of the activities underway, people at the end of the day really just want to focus on how does all of this act impact me personally, right? Like, what does this mean for me? And all of these slides are going to come from the beneficiary's perspective. So we know that there are lots of questions from lots of other groups, too, related to providers and perhaps other stakeholders. We know that you all care about these questions, too. And we hope that these slides give you the information you need to help advise or help guide your, your beneficiary or your, your um, the people who use your services. But the framing of these questions are always going to be from the beneficiary perspective, okay? So we know that in the aging and disability community, actually, can go back one more thing. If in the aging and disability community, there's going to be lots of different people who have slightly different trajectories into managed care, okay? And we're going to, we're going to try to address all of them today, or at least at a high level. So we're going to try to answer the question of, if I receive Medicaid and Medicare, how does this impact me? If I receive CAP VA, CAP C, or PACE, if I am on the CAP VA or CAP C waiting list, if I am in a nursing facility, if I have a Medicaid deductible, if I use services through an L and E M C O. Okay, so next slide. We also know that it's going to be really important to say, well, what if I'm not in any of those groups? And then finally. What if people aren't sure about which groups they're in? Next slide. We're going to do our best to give at least next steps, these basic high-level next steps for all these groups that we've just talked about. That's our goal today. Okay, next slide. So because, uh, <laughs> because I, I'm a bureaucrat, I need to make sure that everybody is clear on a couple of important qualifiers related to within this slide. These slides, okay? First of all, we're giving high level a general sense. We know this is not going to answer every single question you have. We also don't want people to get go into information overload right now. We want to give the most important things that people need to understand today, and then we can currently will always be adding additional information in, this, in future webinars. Um, it's important to know that we all are dynamic people. Our life circumstances change. So we know that your situation today may be slightly different in a few weeks, in a few months. And so we know we can't address every single scenario, okay? We also are using language like likely to or should not intentionally because we don't want for people to feel like there is, a, there is an absolute um, black and white uh, answer to your particular situation until you talk to the enrollment broker, okay? So it's really important that we're being very kind of soft-pedaling the language a little bit here very intentionally. The most important number you can have at this point is the enrollment broker's number, and we'll talk about them in this presentation. Last point, no matter if you enroll in a health plan or stay in Medicaid direct, if you are eligible for Medicaid, you will still receive Medicaid. Okay, so really important point to, to make sure everybody understands. All right. So we have taken a few of the slides that were presented on Tuesday and copied them here just to make sure everybody's clear on when we use terms like enrollment broker, what we're talking about. And so you've probably seen this before, but just as a refresher, when we say enrollment broker, and the enrollment broker function is managed by an organization called Maximus. The enrollment broker is responsible for choice counseling for health plan and, and 
uh, primary care physician selection, primary care provider selection, excuse me, PCP, as part of this, the enrollment broker is also responsible for mailing all notices and handling enrollment. So they are the people who can help guide you through this enrollment process. All right. Next. Like the slide earlier just said, their role is to help people understand what options exist, what different options exist, whether they're going to be enrolling, so what options exist among the health plans in their regions, and what options exist if perhaps they are not going to be enrolling anytime soon. So it's important to know that that choice counseling function is really, really critical uh, to their function. Next slide. Okay. So we are now going to start going into each of those subgroups that I mentioned earlier and getting, again, high-level guidance on where uh, we anticipate things will, uh, the next steps for these particular individuals. Okay. So let's start with people who receive Medicaid and Medicare. So a lot of people in our aging and disability community fall into this category. They are often called duly eligible or the dual. It's really important to know, by legislation, you are not enrolling in a new medic in, in, excuse me, in a health plan right now. You are staying in NC Medicaid Direct. You don't have to do anything. You should not be getting a letter. Okay. Next slide. Next big group. If you use CAPA. CAPC or PACE, if you are actually enrolled in the CAPA program, the CAP for Children program, or the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly, you are staying with North Carolina Medicaid Direct. You will not be enrolling in a new Medicaid health plan right now. You don't have to do anything. Importantly, PACE members uh, will, will, not, will not be choosing a new health plan as well because PACE is already a managed care program, okay? You should not, if you were in any of these groups, you should not receive a letter, okay? If you were in a nursing facility, this gets a little bit more nuanced, okay? But it's important to know and remember that if you have Medicare and Medicaid, you are not enrolling in a new health plan regardless of anything else I say this page. Okay. The second bullet reiterates that Medicaid only nursing facility residents who are in the facility for less than 90 days may be getting a letter and have the opportunity to enroll with a health plan. So if you're Medicaid only, you are not a dual, and you're in the nursing facility for a short-term stay, perhaps a post-acute rehab stay, but you're in there for less than 90 days you may be getting a letter. The third bullet is the opposite of that. If you receive Medicaid, only Medicaid, and are in the facility for more than 90 days, you will not be likely enrolling in a health plan anytime soon, and you will stay with the current Medicaid program. Okay. Next slide. If you have Medicaid only, and are on the waiting list for CAPDA or the CAPC waiver, okay? And I know the CAPC doesn't really have much of a waiting list right now, but if it, if it existed, right? Here's what's important to know. If you have, like I keep saying, if you have Medicare and Medicaid, you are not enrolling in a new health plan, okay? So if you're on the waiting list and you receive Medicaid and Medicare, you are not enrolling in a new health plan. Okay, the next bullet is a little bit more nuanced. If you only have Medicaid, or you don't have Medicare, and are on the waiting list, you may be picking a new health plan soon if you're not otherwise excluded. So let me stop and explain that just a bit more. If a member is on the Medicap VA waiting list and also happens to be in a nursing facility and has been there for over 90 days, right, they are going to be excluded from enrolling in a health plan because they've been in the facility for longer than 90 days. But if you're in your community and you don't fall into any of the other categories we're talking about that excludes you from enrolling, you may get a letter. 
saying, we're going to be enrolling in managed care, and you know, here's the next step. Next one. The concept of the Medicaid deductible is a really uh, big one in our aging and disability community, so we hope that this is helpful for people who may not have otherwise known this or it may not have come to the surface in some of the other presentations. If you have a Medicaid deductible, or sometimes called a spend down, you will not be enrolling in a new health plan right now. You will not be enrolling in a new health plan, and you should not be receiving a letter. Okay. These next few slides, there's going to, there's the, the green coloring is intentional. If you see a green person or green text or green box, just know that we're trying to reflect that you maybe are interested because you have received services from your local manager, your LME NCO. And we're going to provide contact information to all the LME NCOs at the end of this presentation. Um, but it's important to know that if you see green, you're probably um, paying attention and to this because you currently receive services from the LME and CO. To establish some very key, uh, some of the most straightforward criteria, because some of this gets a little, a little, a little twisty. If you are on the Innovations or TBI waiver, you are enrolled in it. You will remain in North Carolina Medicaid Direct. Waiver services will continue to be managed by your LME and COs. You should not receive a letter. Okay. Next slide. This one is a little bit more nuanced. If you are on the Innovations or TBI waiver waiting list, beneficiaries on the Innovation or TBI waiting list um, will have Beneficiaries on the innovations or TBI waiting list will have the option of staying in Medicaid Direct. Excuse me, I realize I'm so sorry, you all. There's a key typo on this. We'll have the option. We'll enroll. We'll have the option of enrolling in a health plan. But no, this is right. Excuse me, you all. That we'll have beneficiaries on the innovations or TBI waiver waiting list will stay in Medicaid Direct. Ooh, excuse me. Beneficiaries will have the option of enrolling in a health plan. If you choose to enroll in a health plan, you can stay on the waiting list. I'm going to say that again because I messed up. Importantly, beneficiaries on the Innovations or TBI waiver waiting list will stay in Medicaid Direct. Unless you want to change over and unless, you, unless you're part of another excluded group, you will stay in Medicaid Direct and you will have the option to enroll in a health plan. If you choose to enroll in a health plan, you can stay on the waiver's waiting list. You won't lose your place in line. Okay, next one. We know that there are lots of other LME and CO populations that have not been reflected in the slides before this, so we're trying to begin to, to do some humble um, clarification uh, where we can without misstepping it and saying something that's inaccurate. So the next few LME and CO populations are also not going to be enrolling in a health plan. These populations are staying in North Carolina Medicaid Direct. PCLI participants, members with significant ID behavioral health or SUD service delivery needs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. State Developmental Center and ICS residents. People without Medicaid who use LME and CO services. So we know that there are lots of folks who don't are not Medicaid eligible and they receive services through state dollars through their LME and COs, sometimes called IPRS funding. Those folks will not be impacted by managed care at all, and they will continue to receive services as they currently exist. If you are in any of these groups, you should not receive a letter. Okay. Now, this is where things, again, get a little bit more nuanced in our behavioral health and IDD and substance addiction community. Some people who currently use LME and CO services, perhaps at a high level or very mild level, like outpatient therapy, will be enrolling in a health plan, assuming they don't, aren't otherwise excluded because they're duly eligible or anything like that. They may be enrolling in a health plan. Folks with more significant service needs will remain in Medicaid Direct with the LME and COs. 
The criteria between the two categories is based on the services the member uses now and their diagnoses. So it's hard for us to go through every single tiny detail on a slide like this and talk about whether people will be enrolled or not. We are really enforcing or encouraging that people call the LMEMCO or the enrollment broker for more information. They're going to have some of the details that people need in order to better understand their direction. Next slide. We wanted to reiterate that the LMEMCOs um, really have a, a strong understanding of you as a member. They have your, 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 your history and your profile and other details that are going to be helpful. So if for whatever reason you're not quite ready to call the enrollment broker with questions, the LMEMCOs can also assist. At the end of the slide deck, we provided the contact information for all of the LMEMCOs. Okay, next slide. If you have Medicaid, and this is kind of starting to be one of the, one of the bigger categories, if you have Medicaid and do not use any of the services previously listed or do not receive Medicare, you may be enrolling in a new health plan soon. You may be getting a letter soon. And the enrollment broker is going to be really important uh, for you to understand what they do and how they can help. We wanted to make a special note to PCS service users and folks who may be adult care home residents because we know we didn't touch on that population specifically, and there's a reason that it, the, the, the population is going to fall into a couple of different categories, okay? So it's important to know that Medicaid beneficiaries who use PCS will often fall into several categories, and it's going to be based on what I mentioned earlier. So if you have PCS, and you are a Medicaid and Medicare member, you are a duly eligible member, you are staying with Medicaid Direct. You are staying in fee for service. You're staying exactly in the services that you receive now. Okay? However, you may only receive Medicaid, and you don't fall into the other excluded categories that I've talked about. You may be getting a letter to enroll. Okay? Importantly, PCS as a service is covered both in our current system and under the health plan. So PCS as a service isn't going anywhere. It's just a matter of who's helping administer it, okay? Importantly, special assistance Medicaid is included in both the Medicaid Direct and the North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care Scope. So if you receive your Medicaid through your special assistance, you are all, this is, all of this still impacts you and all of this still is relevant to you. Some PCS users and adult home residents may enroll with a health plan and others will stay in North Carolina Medicaid Direct. And like I've mentioned before, it depends on factors like if the person also receives Medicare or what other person, other services the person uses. If you're not clear, this is where the enrollment broker once again can help. Okay. So let's shift a little bit and talk about what exactly it means for those folks who may be enrolled in a health plan, okay? So we've said in several areas that you will likely be enrolling in a health plan. You may get a letter saying that you are enrolling in a health plan. You may be going to the enrollment broker to pick a health plan. If that's your situation, when you get a letter or we otherwise find out that you'll be enrolling in a health plan, what does that mean? So it's important to know that based on the regions, you're going to have you're going to have choices of different health plans to pick from, right? And there are several things that are staying the same about services in, uh, that are managed by a health plan. One is the Medicaid eligibility rules are not changing. If you're eligible for Medicaid under fee for service or the Medicaid Direct, you're going to remain eligible for Medicaid under the health plan. What else is staying the same? The service is covered. Okay? If you are moving to a health plan, the service package they provide is going to look exactly like what the state plan services are provided under fee for service. I want to make one quite tight clarification on this, though. This service is covered slide. If you receive services through your LMEMCO, that's a little different. 
And that's where you're really going to want to understand what your eligibility category is, what services you receive through your LME and CO, and talk to people about what services may be available under both the LME and CO and what may or may not be available in the health plan. And again, the enrollment broker can help you understand that. The co-pays that exist will still exist in the health plan. And DSS remains your point of contact for Medicaid eligibility questions. Okay. Next slide. Some of the other benefits of being in a health plan, if you're one of the folks on this call who get a letter saying you're going to be enrolling in a health plan soon, it's important to understand the benefits of that, right? One, there's going to be a network of providers. Two, you can see your physician. There are no monthly premiums. There will be additional call lines available to assist you after hours, and they can help you with referrals, help coordinate referrals to other specialists. I wanted to add this next one um, because it's really important, and this one was actually not covered on Tuesday, but I think it's really important in this population. So if you go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about the care management, the care coordination, care management benefit that health plans currently will be providing, or health plans will be providing. And I pulled this text from a stakeholder engagement effort that we all did years ago, five years ago now, that when managed care was first coming on to, into the discussion um, in the Medicaid space. And we as North Carolina long-term care aging and disability stakeholders were getting together to talk about what we wanted that to look like. And consistently, when people said, when we think about whole person care and coordinated care, it means that people and their families have strong, highly competent, consistent care managers who serve as a person's ally and follow the person through services and across the lifespan. I want to make sure that we just kind of revisit that vision because that, that is essentially what has been driving a lot of the managed care design work related to how this population is served. Next, next slide. And so we want to just spend one slide on so what does that mean to have access or you know, expanded access to whole person care management? Importantly, not every member who enrolls in a health plan will receive care management. A lot of people don't need a care management and don't really benefit from it. There's no need for it. However, we know that in the long-term services and supports community, that care management function is really important and really can assist people in coordinating all of the different parts of their services and really uh, pursuing all different aspects of, of, of leading a full, um, a full life. So we wanted to highlight a couple of the, access, of the details that will happen once the plans actually start providing services, and again, for the regions that we're talking about today, two and four, that will start in November. The plans are going to be doing expedited screenings of support needs of all new enrollees who are older or have disabilities. So they're going to come, and they're going to talk, and they're going to ask questions about how you're doing and what, what kind of supports do you need. And they're required by contract to do that quickly. And they will continue to do that as managed care continues to move, move forward. Importantly, LTSS members will receive care management. LTSS members will receive care management. The level of involvement of care management is probably going to vary based on the person's needs. So some people may have more intense care management than others, but it's really important to reiterate that if you receive an LTSS service, you will receive care management. There are other requirements that the plans have, and frankly that the plans have established for their own expectations, that really advance our goal for whole person care and whole, taking a whole person integrative approach. And so we're not just making sure, we're, we're going to work to make sure that people don't just focus on making sure that you have a doctor, but fully focusing on what do we need to support you in having a full life. We're not going to be the end-all, be-all for everything, and they're certainly not going to be able to solve every challenge, but we're asking them to think broadly. We're asking them to think not just about medical care, but employment. We're not asking them to just think about medical care, but also behavioral health support. We're asking people not just to think about medical care, but housing. 
So we're expanding the scope of what care managers are thinking about as they support their members. We know this is a really important topic, and we have another webinar on the books that we'll talk about in a little bit to really go through that care management function. So stay tuned for more details. But if you're, if you're someone who does get a letter and says you're going to be enrolling in a health plan, it's just important to know that even though change may, have, may, may cause stress in many ways, it's important to know that there are some really important benefits in health plans that may not be available currently, and those benefits will be available to you. Next slide. So kind of getting into some of uh, the, the weeds of exactly what, what happens in the next two weeks. If you are going to be enrolling in a health plan, you will be getting a letter that looks something like this one. And like I mentioned earlier, it's actually going to be a packet. But you will get a letter in that packet that looks something like this one. Okay? Just to let you know, uh, there is a link on the department's website that actually shows all of the letters uh, that members may be receiving. And so if you're interested in that, the link is provided there. Importantly, the next step, if you get this letter, is to call the enrollment broker. That's your next step. So we've talked about people throughout this presentation who may have a clear understanding of what services they receive. They know they're receiving the CAPTA waiver. They know that they're receiving PCS. They know that they're on the Innovations Waiver. We've talked about that. But what if you are someone or are supporting someone who doesn't know? What if you don't know if you're on Medicare? What if you don't know if you have a spend down? What if you know you get some services but you don't know what they're called, right? Because these terms are often used in Medicaid world, but that doesn't mean that everybody uses them. What if you could be in several categories? What if you start in one category, but in, in a month you might be in a different category? Perhaps you're Medicaid only today. You only receive Medicaid today. But in a month, your two-year Medicare enrollment uh, timeline activates, and you're able to get Medicaid and Medicare. In those kind of situations, what if you're in a household where some members are, are going to be enrolled and some members aren't? That actually happens. So all of those kind of situations we know are confusing and that people may have questions. Can you go to the next slide? The next slide and the next step is for you to call the enrollment broker. Okay? If you are confused, if you're not clear, call the enrollment broker. We actually wanted to officially announce we're pretty excited about this and we confirmed right before the call. The enrollment broker toll-free number that's listed here is working. It is active. And the website that is listed here is working and is active. Okay? So if you are in Region 2 or 4, right, and you're going to be getting a letter soon, you, can, you have access to these folks right now. We actually have access to these folks regardless, but we know that the people who are probably going to be calling first are those folks who are impacted uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, next slide. You saw this slide on Tuesday. We copied it directly from them. Um, and this outlines all of the different ways that a person can access the information that an enrollment broker can provide. We know that some people don't need to talk to a live person. Thank you very much. They'd rather look on the web. That's fine. We know some people are really technical and want to have a mobile app on their phone. That's fine. There are different ways for accessing the information that the enrollment broker can provide, and they're all listed here. Next slide. So I think before we go into what's coming next um, and closing out, we have time for a few questions. I don't know, Tracy, if we have any questions. Yes, uh, there are some questions that are coming in. And the first thing I want to address is that uh, there are some questions about the acronyms and spelling them out. Um, and we will get that updated so you have the correct spelling uh, or what each of those acronyms means on the documents. Um, so moving on, it looks like we've got a couple that are kind of provider related. Um, the first one is, uh, my health department is in Region 6, however, my EMS agency feels we need to enter into a contract with Carolina Complete, should we? It's a, it's a great question, great question. You're 
You're absolutely right, Tracy. That is a provider-oriented question. So I'm actually going to defer that, but we're going to give some resources for asking that question and uh, some different places to get some additional information. So I'm going to defer the question, but I will definitely make sure we, we, we highlight where to, where to ask it to. Okay, next okay. question. Uh, the next one is also kind of provider related, um, so it probably has the same answer, but I'll read the question anyways. Um, I'm a provider who supports individuals who have innovations waiver, and I only bill one code that is only uh, covered under the innovations waiver. It's likely that all of my Medicaid clients will have tailored plans. Is it necessary for me to contract with the PHPs, or will the MCO continue to manage the tailored plans? So I'm going to answer part of that question and then defer the rest of it. So it just is, I'll take it from the beneficiary perspective. Innovations waiver services will remain managed by the LME MCOs. Innovations waiver services will remain managed by the LME MCOs. Great. Um, and then there was just a note here uh, regarding that app that you were mentioning on the previous uh, slide. Um, yep. That the enrollment broker app is not going to be available until after July 12th. Um, okay. Apparently. Good so, clarification. Um, next question is, does dually eligible pertain only to those covered by Medicaid and Medicare? What about those who are dually covered by, for example, uh, CHAMP VA and Medicaid or a Blue Cross Blue Shield and Medicaid? It's a great question. I, I, the answer here is it absolutely applies. We're talking about when we say dually eligible being excluded, we are specifically talking about Medicaid and Medicare. I am going to take that as a takeaway, actually, to get a better answer on the other, on the other details. The other question. It's a great question. I know the answer, but I'd like to. I'd like to organize a more organized response. Okay. So in right. this context, we are talking about Medicaid and Medicare members being excluded. Okay. Um, next question: Will there be anything different for people that receive special assistance in home? The special assistance Medicaid eligibility category follows the same direction that all of the other Medicaid eligibility categories fall. So if you receive uh, Medicaid through your special assistance, but you don't and you're, but you only receive Medicaid, you do not have you don't have Medicare, you may be receiving a letter. Again, with the qualification not knowing the specific scenario, the specific circumstances, possibly you will receive a letter. Next question is, will the enrollment broker be trained to not only provide unbiased options counseling about the PHPs, but also other options like PACE? It's a great question. I keep saying that a lot. Y'all are asking some good questions. I want to take that question back, actually, so I'm going to defer that one. Okay. Um, will public health providers be required to get patient authorization to provide services to patients who are enrolled in health care management? Hmm. Another good question, and I'm actually actually going to ask all of you all who are asking me very good questions. Um, if we're not answering them fully today, we're going to actually ask you to submit them through our uh, email uh, inbox so that we can track it and give more organized formal answers. But these are very good questions. I'm going to defer that question. Okay, um, so the next one is um, regarding the letters and um, it says, how long will mailing of letters be delayed? So the, the letters being delayed is, is they are making that final decision early next week. And just for the context, for those of you who may not quite know what's going on, is that the letters were uh, intended to start going out next week. They may still go out next week, but perhaps they may be delayed by a, a week or two. So we are, the language that we are providing is very intentional, and it's that the letters will be um, start being sent in July, um, which obviously starts next week. Okay. Uh, next question is, we assist many consumers who are older adults and people with disabilities. If they did not receive an enrollment letter, uh, 
how um, how do we help them check to make sure that they should or should not enroll? Is this something that the enrollment broker will know? So I think if I'm following the question, we, we can we can answer that one. One thing to be really clear on, um, probably should have underlined this earlier, is letters have not yet been mailed. So no one has received the letters we're talking about today. Okay, so just because you haven't received one doesn't mean anything right now because they haven't been released. The other thing is important to remind, uh, to be rem to, to remember, is that letters are going to be mailed in July for people who are in regions two and four. So there will be a whole other letter release in the fall for the other region. Okay, if you, if, if so, so. If you're like, hmm, I haven't received a letter. If you're in Region 2 or 4 and you haven't received a letter in July, and you're like, I really don't know what's up here, it's always going to be your next step to call the enrollment broker. Always going to be your next step to call the enrollment broker. Right, and the last question here is kind of uh, more of a personal situation uh, that is in reference to uh, a son. It says, my son is 20 and still has Cap C. He has Medicaid and Medicare. Will he switch when he ages out? Um, he's on PDN as well, um, and he has managed care uh, through Medicare at this time. So that one sounds like it's a little bit of a complicated personal situation. Do you have any com comments for that? It, it, it is. It, as long as everything that the, 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 the question asker has is accurate, if, if the, the beneficiary receives Medicaid and Medicare, and because the beneficiary receives catch for children for two reasons, the, the, that member will not be enrolling in a health plan. That member will stay in Medicaid direct. Two different reasons, actually. All right. Well, that is the last question. So, if we are ready to move on to the next slides, we can. I think that's great. Great. There you go. Okay. So, thank you all for asking the good questions. Um, what I'm going to actually ask those of you who who submitted the questions that I was not able to answer or needed to defer, if you would please submit your question to this inbox because they're tracked that way, we can give you organized answers and we can make sure that those answers are distributed to other folks as well. So I appreciate the questions and I'm sorry that I was not able to answer more of them today. Again, we also, these questions also help us um, prepare for some of the future webinars we have coming up. So thank you for asking them today. That definitely helped me. But if you want the answer sooner rather than later, please also submit your question to this website or this email. Okay, so I keep talking about all of these upcoming things that are happening, and we know that there are lots of webinars underway right now, which is a great thing. Um, so this is only uh, a, a few of them, and the ones that are uh, directly related to some of the stuff we're talking about today, and that the department is sponsoring. So we really encourage folks to uh, get as much information as they can from whatever source makes sense to you, um, but we did want to make sure you understood what uh, options we were we're going to be putting together over the next several weeks. So in uh, July, we have two webinars scheduled. The first one is going to be the North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care from an LTSS perspective. This is going to be an overview. Um, many folks have already uh, attended something similar. We've put on something these things uh, in the past, so some of this may be a little bit uh, primary for some folks, but we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get just the basics, especially after they have a better appreciation for exactly what, if they're going to be enrolling in a health plan or not. The second one is a real focus on care management within the health plan. So again, for those folks who are going to be enrolling in a health plan and picking a health plan, making sure that they have an sense and an appreciation for what that care management role will be. And so on the 25th, we'll be focusing on that one. The final one is going to be scheduled for August. We are still nailing down the date. But this one is really going to be a much more provider focused. And... Uh, 
uh, it's going to be supporting the, LT, the supporting the LCSS community through the transition to managed care. And we're going to be talking uh, from a provider perspective about how to ensure that, uh, you know, as, as you are enrolling in with the plans and as you are becoming part of their network, making sure people are clear also when we go to launch in November that you understand the PA submission process making sure you understand how to ensure you, take, you, you, you get paid, other dynamics that are related to that crossover um, uh, time, frame, time period. So that's going to be in August, um, but we are still putting that, we, are, we will be putting that together. Next slide. If you are interested in staying uh, current and updated, uh, we always encourage people to go to the North Carolina Medicaid Transformation website. Uh, you probably have it bookmarked at this point, but if you Google North Carolina Medicaid Transformation, you will come up on it and you can uh, look there for information and announcements. Um, providers may also benefit if you aren't already by signing up for the North Carolina Tracks email distribution list. Um, and I should have put this on here. If you got your email today, if you got this announcement for today's session through the roundtable, we will also be distributing those uh, future session announcements through this uh, listserv as well. Um, and the department, finally, that final bullet. Sorry, Tracy, can you go back one more? Yeah. So the final bullet under that first section is that uh, the department is also really working to um, identify other ways for reaching members directly and making sure that people have as up-to-date information as they can um, on the process and what's happening. So more information to come and more opportunities to come on that. Um, to register for the webinars, uh, again, the link here is, is, is here. Again, if this is on the Medicaid Transformation website, it's under the provider section for transition to managed care. Um, but the link is provided here. Again, we will be sending out uh, registration links through the listserv as well. And then, uh, like I said, we'll be sending it out through this email and uh, other provider networks as well. So, um, but if you if you want to be proactive and register, it's available on that uh, web, on the website at that link. Next slide. Okay. So today's key te key takeaways, and if it sounds like I'm repeating myself, that's a good thing because I'm trying to. Um, importantly, whether you will be enrolling in North Carolina Medicaid managed care, whether you will be enrolling in a health plan, or whether you will be staying in Medicaid Direct depends on a lot of things that have probably become pretty clear today. If you are going to be enrolling or have the option to enroll in North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care, you will likely be getting a letter soon. So be on the lookout for a packet. For people in Phase 1 counties, again, that Region 1, or excuse me, Region 2 and Region 4, these letters will come in the next few weeks. So they haven't come yet, but they should be coming in the next few weeks. If you have questions about your eligibility for managed care or need help through the process, please call the enrollment broker. And just importantly, LME and COs and DSSs are also prepared to help. They may eventually transfer you to the enrollment broker, but if you feel more comfortable going to those channels first, that's absolutely okay. We re reestablish the contact information for the enrollment broker here. Next slide. And just to make sure Nobody missed it. If you have questions about your eligibility for North Carolina Medicaid managed care or need help through this process, please call the enrollment broker. LME NCOs and DSSs are also prepared to help. And again, the enrollment broker details provided. I think we are finished. Um, just as a heads up, if you want to go to the next slide, we wanted to like show or either in the slide deck, you do have all the contact information for the different LME and COs. So if you're not sure uh, how to access your LME and CO, you can look at the regional map we shared earlier and then look uh, for the, the, the county if it's covered by um, this, whatever LME and COs covers your, your area. Tracy, if you don't mind going back to the thank you. Okay. You all, again, thank you. We hope this was helpful and uh, productive. Um, again, we know we didn't answer every question, and we really appreciate the questions that were asked because they will absolutely help us in informing future sessions as well. We are really looking forward to uh, the next several months and looking forward to having increased engagement about uh, managed care and the transition to managed care um, and the experiences of folks um, in the aging and disability community. So thank you for joining today. We hope you have a really good Friday and a great weekend.
Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.